Hey, 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 hey! Are you ready? I'm ready. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm excited. I'm, Some say I'm... I was born ready. Who said that? I, who, I, I can't who said remember that? exactly. <laughs> We'll find somebody to say it today. We promise. We'll find somebody. We'll be right back. This is the Me and Jesse podcast. Get ready. It's time for the Me and Jesse podcast with Mark Pavlich and Jesse Martineau. Welcome back to the Me and Jesse podcast, everybody. I am Mark Pavlich, and in the Grove, the one and only, the big sexy, never changes, always gets better. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Jesse Martin. Thank you very much, Mark. Good to see everybody tonight. We have a great show tonight, as always. Don't even kid yourself. We have Louis Brusque joining <laughs> us tonight. Louis, voice, Louis. Voice of the Oilers, oh. but actually more so national level now. He's, he's really... Uh, uh, stepped up stepped up stepped big up. time and so he does a lot of the national games too which is awesome but first of course uh you know it's thank you for tuning in thank you for watching thank you for commenting and liking and sharing this video someone asked me the other day they said should i share these i'm like <laughs> yeah. Have, yeah have you not been watching the show <laughs> <laughs> you don't ask for for your money we just ask you you hit that nice like button Co Correct. Hit that share button. And then, of course, comment because we love putting your comments on the screen, all those awesome faces that we see on there. And then your comments come up. And it's really cool. We love that. So and we got some fun. We got some funny fans. We, we got some we funny do. fans. So let her, let her fly tonight, guys. It's, it, it, yeah. it's going to be a great conversation with Louie, of course. Uh, if you're in the Edmonton area, make sure yeah. you check out Boston Pizza, Hampton Market, Windermere. It's at the top of your screen right there. You can just head on in. Say Mark and Jesse sent you. And try and the lasagna. Try the lasagna. Try the lasagna. <laughs> Eat the lasagna. And, Get the uh, lasagna. <laughs> make sure you do that too. Uh, hey, but, and say hi. Say hi to Terry too. Yeah, Terry's the to owner Terry. uh, of the of the one in, in Hampton and the one in in uh, Windermere. Yes. And he's just a gem of a guy. And uh, we, we really thank him for being part of the Me and Jesse podcast. We yes. really do. Thank you very much. And without any further ado, here is uh, Sportsnet Hockey Night in Canada. Um, player to press box but in the good way yeah louis debrusque everybody well welcome to the show louis it's uh great to have you uh very excited to have you the voice more than the voice of just the oilers now you you are all over the place aren't you yeah i'm kind of you know jumping around from place to place but yeah no i do predominantly most games i do have oilers in them i do the regional oilers games but also do the Late hockey night in Canada games on Saturday night, and some some national games as well. Where I'll sometimes be doing different teams, but the one common denominator is I'll have a, a Canadian team in the mix. It'll be uh, usually out west here as well. But yeah, I get around, do some different games. But uh, do you notice? Do you know? Do you notice that people are jumping on your bandwagon finally when it when it comes to commentating? Like <laughs> like when you first yeah. no when you no when you first started, yeah. people people are all chirping. They're all saying, "Ah, yeah. he can't he can't do this. He can't do this." And then yeah. all of a sudden, everybody all of a sudden is like on is on the Louis bandwagon, and I'm I'm loving it. You know, I guess it's just time to be honest with you guys. Yeah. I think you yeah. you put in the time, you put in the effort, you work, and uh, I think people appreciate that that you've been around and you're right. you've been around the game and you uh, you know have covered a team for a certain period of time. Then they start to look at the positives instead of the negatives. I would say, but I think everybody goes through that. I think every yeah. new broadcaster goes through that whole ordeal of there's going to be people that are not going to like you. There's going to be people that do like you. Um, and you know what? I experienced that too. I was coming in after Ray Ferrero, who came in right. after Craig Simpson with the Edmonton right. Oilers. Right. So I mean, those yeah. are two, you know, amazing broadcasters that are that are huge shoes to fill. Um, you know, coming in, I was kind of oblivious to that. I'm not going to be honest. I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't yeah, really look at it that way. I just came in and was doing a job. But you realize very quickly that 
um, you go hand in hand with your team. You know, that's just the nature of our world. Uh, we love the game of hockey. We love to watch it. We're very up close and personal. We know every single detail about this game. And I wouldn't have it any other way, to be honest with you. I, I used to take offense to some of the stuff that was said, but now I just kind of look <laughs> yeah. at it and say, hey, I have an opinion. You're entitled to yours as well. Yeah, of course. So your 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 playing career obviously took you all a few different places, but Edmonton. How was your time in Edmonton back then, and versus now? I mean, a different era, yeah. different different time frame. But what is it like for you in Edmonton now? You know, it's uh, it's interesting. It's back when I played. Don't get me wrong. It was, uh, you know, when you're an oiler in this town you know, your news, right? There's, yeah. there's just no getting around that. You're you're in the yeah. limelight, your news, and, you know, people know a lot about you. They, you know, back then, we didn't have the same platforms we have now. We didn't have no. cell phones. Not everybody had a camera and a video camera on their on themselves at all times like we do now with mm. our cell phones, mm-hmm. if you want to call it a cell phone, because it's really, you know, it's a whole bunch of things in one. It is. Social media platforms in that regard, we just didn't have that. We didn't have the internet. Computers weren't up and running really until later in my career with Edmonton in the mid nineties where I got my first computer and you don't know, want to know how much I spent for my first computer oh, because it was yeah. ridiculous, <laughs> ridiculous. Uh, how much a computer cost back then. But I like gaming just like the kids nowadays like gaming. So I got the computer to game, but you know, so what I'm saying is you could go out and you get recognized. Don't get me wrong. People would recognize who you were in the certain areas that we would hang out and all that kind of stuff. But it wasn't overwhelming like it is now. I'm sure hmm. the players today oh, yeah. are just, you know, the, the, the amount of attention they get out in the public is probably just extreme. I would imagine it's extreme. And a player like Connor McDavid or Leon Dreisaitl, I mean, they go out, they have to probably really monitor where they're going and make sure that they set it up beforehand because it would just be a little bit overwhelming, I'm assuming, with right. all the attention they would get. Yo, oh, yeah. Um, for me, I think I get recognized more now being a, being, being a commentator because your face is on the camera all yeah. the time, to be honest. And I, right. I think people in general – just love talking hockey. You know, everybody I bump into, whether it's at the grocery store, the Home Depot, Cabela's, yeah. it doesn't matter where I go. Um, you know, people want to stop and talk shop. They want to talk the Oilers. And to be honest with you guys, I'm always willing to talk about the game because that's what I do for a living. Sure. But I've always been that way. And probably why I steered in the direction of broadcasting hmm. was uh, it's always something that I love to do. I never, ever mind talking about the game. Well, we've Louis, met once before, the, and, and sorry, oh, sorry we, we've, we've met once before, and it's true. Like, yeah, you, you answer any question, and, and yeah. it didn't matter. And that's, I think, what people really are appreciating about you because – your character kind of comes through on the camera as well. It comes through on yep. the broadcast. Like this guy's not going to, you know, BS us around. He's not going to, you know, make things. He's going to tell how it is. Now in yep. your, in, in the past, you've been vocal about officiating to a certain yeah. degree about, you know, sometimes, especially in the playoffs in the bubble last year, yeah. it was, mm-hmm. it was all over the place. Let's be honest. It was all over the place. And so how do you find your role in that broadcast booth able to influence or affect um, the game itself. I don't truly know if it does have an effect, to be honest with you. I'm sure they do listen and they hear those those comments and they hear some of the things that we talk about. They're watching like everybody else, mm. but they have an agenda as well. They, they have a job to do. Um, first and foremost, disclaimer, listen, I know that's not an easy job. I know the game goes right. really fast right. and we have the luxury of looking at replays over two, three, over. five times yeah. and yeah. in slow motion to see what actually happened on the play. So I always do take that into consideration. And I understand that in the speed of the mo- in the in the speed of the game and in the crucial moments when things happen, and I'm down at ice level quite a bit, so mm-hmm. I'm down between the benches. And when I'm down there, there's a lot of times things will happen, and again, I'll have to take a second look just to clarify what I thought I saw. Right. Yeah. And I would say, you know, 50-50, whether or not I saw it right the first time or wrong the first time. That's because right. sometimes I look at it and say, okay, that's what I thought I saw. And then there's other times I look at it and go, wow, that was not <laughs> what I thought I saw. Right. So. Yeah. I do have, you know, you know, a little bit for me, I feel for the officials at times because some of the things that they have to call, mm. I just feel that they can get some help. And I've always been very uh, sure. vocal in the sense that I think, you know, some people don't want more replays, more video replays in the game. I'm the opposite. Mm. I say, you yeah. know what, if you're going to make a call, let's get it right. Yeah, Puck goes over the glass. It's, it's either over the glass directly or it's not directly over the glass. Correct. They should be able to go and confirm that with, a video replay, it'll take them 10 seconds. 100%. And therefore, yep. nobody's getting a penalty that 100%. shouldn't have got a penalty. And if somebody should have got a penalty, they're going to get a penalty. What about the coach's um, challenge that, part of it now? Because that's something yeah, that, yeah. you know, even basketball well, is doing more so. 
you know, you could even include that in that. That that's something you know, you know, broaden that horizon of what coaches can challenge. So if a coach and they have, you know, they all have video um, coaches that are in behind the scenes watching every little minute detail of the game. So when something happens, they can jump right to it. Why can't a coach say, "Hey, listen, I want to challenge that over the glass penalty you're giving us for delay a mm. game"? I don't think it went yeah. directly over the glass. I think it was tipped. They watch the video. You know what? You're right, coach. So therefore, you maintain your challenge, and there's no penalty on the play. That's right. If it's if it actually did go over directly, then you know what? Not only are you getting this penalty, but you're also going to put another guy in the box. So you Oof. better be really Oof. sure Oof. before you challenge that penalty. Yeah, 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 so, yeah. I just think that, number one, you're not going to have that many that are challenged. What's it going to happen? Five to 10, 15 times a year where somebody's going to challenge that call because it's the wrong call? Correct. And for me, you're helping the officials out. Right. And that's really what I'm getting to here is because the game's so fast, because you have two referees on the ice now with now. two different personalities, yeah. Yeah. I'm telling you that you're going to have some differences. It's just natural. We're all different the way we see the game. We're all different in the position we are on the ice to see the game, mm. too. So what I see from this angle, you might see from a different angle and see an entirely different play. And that, for that reason only, there are going to be some differences in the calls. Back in the day when it was one official, um, they had their stamp on the game. Yeah. They kind of let things go sometimes. They didn't let That's things right. go early in the game. That's and right. they kind of dictated that with their mentality, their personality, how they were going to ref that game. And the players typically knew that early mm. on by the way they were calling penalties. Now it is... Now, now it is differently, but do you think because adding that extra referee has changed the game that much? Oh, I do. Yeah, because do. because you look at it now and you go, like some of the officials look like they're watching the game, not officiating the game because there's so many yeah. on that. There's two lines with two referees, and it just seems like that's what they're missing now. Like it, when it, before when it was just one referee, it was a little more yeah. clear. The, the tone mm -hmm. of the game was clear all the way through. Now it's different. You're right. And let's be clear. They they. they... Yeah added another official for a reason it was a reason because the game was getting really fast of course and it's just really hard to cover that cover that ground by one referee so two referees i think is better don't get me wrong that's four eyes instead of two watching things but in that you're going to have that lost in translation mm -hmm. there's going to be some of that mm -hmm. where you're just maybe both focused on the same thing and you know, I've had conversation with officials. I won't say names. This is my dog, Tampa, who always likes to get into every every uh, meeting that I have in this office. But, you know, and they've said, listen, just like us, sometimes you get caught up in your watching certain things on the ice and you yeah. don't see things that happen. Right. And we'll say, how could you not see that? Well, because there's so many moving parts on the ice, right. when you're focused in a certain direction, you might not see that infraction off to the right-hand side. And that's just human. That's just something that that's happens right. sometimes. And I have no problem with that. Sometimes a missed call, I just, I let it go. I just mm. kind of go, you know yeah. what, it's a missed yeah. call. Mm -hmm. Hey, got away with one there. Right. You know, okay. Right. It's the calls that are made that I don't think were an infraction that I have a really hard time with. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, that's, that, yeah. you know, no, honestly, I, I really don't mind. I would rather have a missed call than a call that wasn't I agree. a call. Yep. And that's just kind of how I feel about it. But listen, I know for a fact that every single referee to a man is trying to get it right every single time. That's not going to yeah. happen. Just like I butcher things on the air, it's not going to happen perfect every Correct. single night. And you have to give them the benefit of the doubt in that regard. But there are times when it's just sometimes you just have to say, listen, they're having an off night and they need to get it in, reel it in here because they've missed some calls or they've made some calls that weren't penalties. Let's talk about your playing career. Now you played for a number of teams, but you're – you're a tough dude. <laughs> you, your fight. Yeah. Mark, Mark okay. called me the other yeah, day and he's like, yeah, I don't think yeah. he's ever lost a fight. Like actually yeah. lost. one. No, no. Because when yeah. I watch, when I listen, Louie, I was in the fighting business for 16 years. I own the biggest MMA show in the country for 16 years. I know fighting and, and there's, there's ways that you were fighting that I watched every fight. Now, prior to this interview, I did not, I watched two or three, the McSorley ones and those type of ones. Yeah. But the crazy part is when I was watching you fight, the thing I was astonished by was your gas. You had yeah. great, you had great gas for fighting. Now people don't understand that. People that don't know about fighting have no clue what that means. There's an expression in fighting that fatigue makes cowards of us all, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, there was, and there was a lot of guys that mm -hmm. you were fighting against where you were kind of like manhandling, and they were just getting gas. And then you started to load off, and, and yeah. that was the that was the thing that I watched, and I was like, wow. I said, Jesse, like I was shocked on the level of your fighting skills. Not the point about so much about the fighting, just your mentality when it came to fighting. Yeah, you know, and I was a thinker. I really was. Yeah, you know, yeah. Jesse, you, Jesse, you and I talked about this, the grappling right. part of it when jujitsu came around, you mm. know, when Hoist Gracie came over in the first, you know, first battle um, UFC, I was, you know, I was just, I couldn't believe it. You know, it just shocked me the way, 
you know, 175 pound guy, if he was that yeah. came over and just tied guys up in knots and made them mm -hmm. submit. And I, you know, I would rewind it and watch it and go, how do you do yeah. that? Like, what's he doing? And, you know, now a days, these fighters that are coming up in mixed martial arts, they're trained in every single facet of the game. And it's amazing to see how complete they are as fighters. For me, I always was a student of the game. I really was. And I think yeah. that if I would have ever gotten into MMA or if I would have been in boxing, which I did dabble with a bit, and, you know, training-wise, I used to train boxing and I, you know, used to go and, you know, hit the heavy bag and the hand pads with Daryl Duke. And we used to yeah. do 10 rounds, you know, three-minute rounds in the hand pads because he wanted me to build up that stamina. But for me, you know, I was always kind of thinking through the fight. And, yeah, you, you know, could Ty, see it. Yeah, Ty Domi kind of said something to me. We played together with the Rangers. He said, you know, Louis, he goes, you're fighting – not to lose more often instead of fighting to win and it yep. was kind of one of those statements that i thought of and i said yeah you know you're probably yeah. right you know my just my mentality was and it was funny because when i was younger i was much way much more of a cowboy you know I, we always yeah. call the cowboys mm -hmm. the gunslingers yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mile, it's like let's yeah. go toe to toe no defense yeah, yeah. those are the most exciting fights in the world to watch i love watching those fights <laughs> but i know truly that if you were to try and do that against the heavyweights back when I came into the league, <laughs> I agree. I'm telling you, your career is going to be pretty short. Wow. Your yeah. career is wow. going to be short because you're going to be on your your ass more often than yeah. not, and you're gonna you're gonna probably have some damage. And Kelly Chase was a player that I skated with at the Wendell Clark Hockey School back when I was 16, 17. We used to coach the kids during the day, and then we would have a two hour wow. session on the ice with the pros. And we used to wrestle and grapple and hold on to mm. each other. And that he was the first one that actually showed me how to tie guys up. Literally. Wow. Um, I, I didn't have a clue. I used to just grab guys. And it was like, if I can get off more punches in a hurry than he can, I'm going to do some damage because I'm a pretty big, strong guy. And that's kind of how I won a lot of my fights early on in junior. Mm. But then he said, you know, if you continue to do that, you're going to get up against the Tony Twists of the world. You know, right. the, big, the big guys yeah, yeah, that are yeah, going to, yeah. like, literally, yeah. Yeah. you know, put you into the 15th row. And that's only going to happen a couple of times, and you're not going to like that very much. So I, I became kind of a student of the game in the sense that I used to know a lot about every fighter, used to know their tendencies, and I would try and use that against them in the sense that I was pretty comfortable with both hands. So if I had to throw lefts against a real and strong right hand, yeah. if I could cross grab a guy, yeah, yeah. reach over top, um, all those little things that I'm sure in the MMA world that you know so well, in the hockey world, there's a lot of things you can do to, to, to benefit yourself in the fight, turning the body, making mm. sure your left shoulder is yeah. forward, protecting yeah. your chin yeah. with yeah. your shoulder, yeah. all of that. And I was aware of all that. I used to put a sweater, I used to tie a jersey around a heavy bag, grab onto that heavy bag and throw punches and duck and just learn how not to get hit. Wow. And it, it was another level. It's another level. It's yeah, another level. No, you know, honest to God, Louis, it was impressive. You like know, when it, I, when I watched how you fought in the clinch, like you were, that's yes. why you would have been, you would have been a way better MMA fighter than boxer yeah. because your brain was, you when, when you were in the clinch, the way you used to reverse people in the clinch yeah. was, it was incredible. I was saying to people, MMA fighters should watch how you did it because the <laughs> well, way you did it was so intelligent. And I watched it over and I'm like, can you believe this? Like I had no clue that you had this level of fighting. No, listen, hockey fighting is one thing the yeah. way your your mentality was definitely yeah. made for high level mma there's no question you know it's funny i used to hear them say that all the time dirty boxing or almost dirty boxing right. i think yeah. i even heard yeah. like joe rogan a few times say yeah. like hockey fight like it's almost like you're grabbing on and you know you're just starting to chuck and you know that that's it's a lot more difficult when you're trying to fight through jerseys elbow mm. pads, oh, yeah. pads harder. And you're holding on and you know you just don't have that freedom with your punches correct um i don't know you know what i i gotta tell you i have the utmost respect for the athletes in the mma world i think they're some of the most conditioned athletes in the mm. world they have a a drive and a mental toughness that i don't think right. people can really relate to and unless you've been in some form of the fight game to understand what it takes to get yourself <laughs> psyched up every time to right. go out there and fight we used to do that on a nightly basis, and I, I used to always say to myself, I think I'd like training for three, four months for one fight. You know, just training for three, four months. I mean, just being just eating your cornflakes in the morning going, I'm fighting this guy in like 60 days. I can't wait, you know, just, just waiting to get in there and, uh, you know, and then just let it go, right? And even yeah. in that hmm. situation, you see some guys bonk. They just don't, you know, the pressure, the, the lights. The yeah, mental the pressure to the body is incredible. There's a real connection there. Mm. And the guys that are freer at throwing punches and just being relaxed in that environment yeah. typically are the guys that just, as the fight goes on, just continue to flourish in the fight. But I love it. I really do like the fight game. I think it's outstanding. And 
Um, for me, you know, I was, I was, I was a defensive fighter. I'll say that right away. I was not a guy that was going to go and exchange punches with a guy if I didn't have to. Mm. I just didn't make sense to me. Why would I take a shot if I didn't have to? Yeah, you know, and I just uh, in junior I was probably a lot stronger than guys, so I could get away with it more, and I could usually get my arm loose and get punches in. When you get to the NHL, though, the American Hockey League, even there was some just really tough guys. I mean, there was yeah. there was three or four guys on every team when I broke into the league, and crazy. Every single guy was mega tough. They really yeah. were. Like I mean, yeah. I and that's why probably now when I when I call fights in hockey. I always give both guys the, the benefit of the doubt. And I always give both guys the credit because mm, yeah. just dropping your gloves, just answering that bell to me, mm. you're courageous. Well, yeah. Louis, I grew up, I grew up in the neighborhood in my neighborhood in Windsor, Ontario. Yeah. I, I grew up three blocks away from Bobby Probert. Yeah. And then, and then, and then right in bell river was Ty Domi and we were on spring break together. And I saw Bobby Probert shit can this kid at a bush party one day before he made it <laughs> before before he made it to the nhl people did not understand they thought oh he's just some junior yeah. tough guy and when it really came down to it it was like oh my god Different someone world. called nine yeah someone called nine one one because when bobby <laughs> probert you know took yeah. off his lumber jacket it was just nuts <laughs> but pe but people yeah. didn't understand the toughness the toughness i i uh probably was my favorite you know and i got yeah. to oh, him in chicago so i was so happy that i got to spend some time with him um you know, and hang out with him for a bit, uh, you know, gone way too soon. You yeah, know, I agree. that's so yeah. sad when I think about it, just because I know we had a tumultuous, just a real yeah. roller coaster ride, as a lot of us have, have in the hockey world, and especially being an enforcer. Mm -hmm. But I will say this, um, I don't think there's anybody over the course of history that wouldn't say that he was the number one guy. Oh, like, I I'm agree. sorry, yeah. just the way, and the thing for, the thing for Probert for me and you know, you know the tough guy documentary, and you watch that, mm -hmm. and you, and you, I mean, for me, he never really stopped. You know, he yep, always right. just understood what his role was, and he That's always right. went out there. Even when late in his career, he was fighting a lot of young big guys coming up and not winning all those fights, and he still showed up every single day, he still did. dropped the gloves, still fought those tough guys, and right to the end, right to the bitter end, he was yeah. not going to go down without swinging. And that's the thing for me that I just. You know, I look at him, it brings a smile to my face because he was just naturally just one of those guys that knew what he had to do, went out there and did it and didn't really complain too much about it. It was just his job, right? That's right. How How is your how's your head now with that? Did you, did you ever get the bell rung a lot or? You'll have to ask my wife. She'll probably <laughs> say that there's certainly some side effects from taking a few shots to the yeah. head. You know, and I listen, I, I jokingly joke about this stuff. I know this is not joking, right. joking matters. Yeah. This is real serious stuff. It really is. When you're talking about brain injuries, mm -hmm. Uh, mental yeah. health. I mean, this is this is stuff nowadays that, uh, you know, for me, I um, I want nobody to have to feel any of those yeah. effects of things like that. I think I'm good though. Thanks for asking, Jesse. You know what? For me, yeah, I took some shots, but like I said, I was a pretty defensive yeah. fighter. So although I don't know how many fights I was in in my career, it had to be over 150 in the NHL anyway. Well, um, I know that uh, you know I didn't take that unnecessary punishment. Oh. I was yeah. pretty yeah. I, I would say that yeah. I probably the concussions that I had were from hits you know I yeah. had a couple blindside hits that mm. uh, you know were the only times in my career that I can remember that I got buckled that right. I got you know I wasn't knocked right unconscious you know flat but I got my bell rung a few times where I had to miss some time because of concussions and it was from hits yeah. it was from yeah. hits not fights yeah so now with the the attempt to change the game in terms of hitting how do you think that's played out? How do you think that's changed the game in terms yeah. of maybe, you know, stick handling that extra move over the blue line now versus where back in the day, Scott Stevens no. was there. Yeah. yeah. Scott Stevens, <laughs> forearm, shiver, and elbow were there. Yeah. That's um, right. I've talked. That guy was just, uh, was, he was a headhunter. You know, he really was. But that's how we hit. That's how we hit back yeah. then. So yeah. when I look at it, I, yeah, we can't even, say, yeah, yeah, they, yeah, it wasn't even a penalty. You no. know, some of the stuff yeah, was today yeah. is like, yeah. You know, but I'll tell you this, Jesse, I think it's been great for the game. I really do. And I know that when it first started to happen, you're, there's always that resistance to yep, pull back. And say, sure. I don't want to take that old school out of the game. The kids are just too skilled now, though. They're too skilled, they too fast. The speed of the game made them start to enforce those rules. And Brendan Shanahan, Shanahan, or call him whatever you want. Yeah. He went in and he attacked headshots. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was an absolute necessary thing to do. 100%. It was a necessary thing to do. And for me, having a kid coming up through the ranks right. and now playing in the league, I did not want him coming across the line with his head down and getting it taken off like Eric Lindros and Scott yeah. Stevens. 
Yeah. I didn't want to see that happen to him. Too early. Um, so here's the thing. It allows players to handle the puck more, have the confidence to handle that puck, to do it at a high speed, and not have the fear that somebody's going to take that liberty and headshot them. Good, yep. clean hits are still going to hurt you if you hit them hard. Yep. You can yep. shoulder to shoulder. We just you know, recently have seen a couple hits this year where guys have been hit with a good, clean body check. And, yes, they get injured from those hits from yep. time to time because they're just solid hits. Yeah. Still a physical game, yeah. but That's you right. have to do it within the – in the rule book right. yep. in order to make it happen for me the, the next one for me is hits from behind guys for me the, yeah. the one that i always will key on when i'm doing games mm -hmm. and i don't care who it is that does it you hit a guy in the numbers should be called every time number one i agree every time every and if time. there's if it's a, if it's a pretty hard hit i think he should be suspended or fined for it right. every yeah. single time yeah. i just yeah. think that's the next one that if George Peros wants to really make a name for himself. That's the one hit that I think they need to eliminate from the game. Because guys are getting well, crunched. Now, still when you guys go into the, the boards, turn? though, yeah, the what turn. What about the turn? I was just going to say that. Yeah, no. yeah well, because that's... people are doing that on purpose, Louis. It, like, like, me yep. too. I agree with you. Get rid of those hits. But what I'm noticing now is defensemen are doing the turn, right? Yep. And it's like at the last second. And it's like there's the fine line of that, that hit when we're going to make that rule for that. It's like, well, okay, but he turtled. Like, he turtled and twisted. It's a horrible and, and, position to put yourself yeah. Yeah, number one i don't know is. why you would do that I, but I, i'm I of agree. the belief i agree i'm of the belief why would you ever do that number one we were taught I, not to turn yeah. your back on a hit that yeah. was always, the way we were now i know always. it's puck protection so i mean if a guy has a puck on a stick which he has to have in order to hit him uh and he's trying to make that move this is what it is for me though and i'll tell you this right now and any player will back this up that's played the game at any level almost you know yeah when you have the ability to minimize and that's why they use that word when they describe the hit <laughs> minimize minimize because yeah. i can tell you this right now yeah. i hit a lot of guys where i couldn't minimize but i didn't mm. okay yeah yeah and i also had yeah. guys in positions where i did minimize you have that control as the hitter it's in, it's the responsibility of the hitter now i will say this at that last second if a guy makes a sharp move there's nothing that hitter right. can do there's yeah. nothing that hitter hitter can do once he's fully committed Engaged, to the yeah. hit but if you have even two three feet and you see a guy change a position and you just decide to continue to blow through there as aggressively as possible, that's on you. The hit. Yeah. And yeah. that's what I'm saying. You can yeah. minimize. And that's all that they want to see is the fact that you tried not to totally destroy right. a guy. Right. But again, teach kids to take the hit, not to turn from the hit. Hmm. It, 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 has yeah, to still to. Be, it still has to be part of the education. The yeah. thing that I don't like though, is when a guy goes in and like five, six feet away, the numbers are there, and they continue to yes. hit. That's to me, that is a no-brainer for me. Yeah. Yeah. That's a no-brainer for me. Penalty and most likely a suspension. Yeah. I think you need to start buckling down on that. Yeah, yeah, no, 100%. absolutely. It, I mean, <laughs> they used to kick you out of the game for high sticking and making someone bleed. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> this is like well, something that can end someone's life essentially. It's, yeah. it's just it's just one of those things, and I, I think that every player would say it too. They'd rather have a guy try and take their head off than hit them in the numbers. Right. You know, hitting yeah. getting hit in yeah. the numbers, you're the most vulnerable. You can't see it coming. It's going to result in a really bad injury one day. Knock on wood. I hope it never does. I mm. hope it doesn't have to because I hope they right. buckle down on it and just take it out of the game. Yeah, absolutely. No, it, as no, much it, as possible. There's always going to be gray areas, like you yeah, said. I is. understand <laughs> that. It is. But yeah. The obvious ones you need to start taking out of the game. Louis, what's your what's your average time at Cabela's? <laughs> what, come on, I gotta know because I know. Like, say we have, hey, wait say we, a second. Like, you wait, want to know what I tell my wife? How long I've been <laughs> no, there for? I, I, or... I, I, want the I want you to tell. I want the me and Jesse podcast to get the real yeah. goods here. The yeah. second you walk in the door oh, to the God. second you leave, what, uh, yeah. give me like between zero and thirty minutes, honestly. Oh, or I'm, 60, over, I'm over. Sixty to I'm ninety. Over Eighty minutes. Sixty to, I got the 60 over. to yeah. ninety. Sixty to ninety. It's That's 60 I'm... to 90 for sure. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, I mean, listen, I've gone in quickly, but even a quick trip in there is 30 plus. But on a regular trip, I'm going to talk to 10, 15 people in there when I'm walking around yeah. about hunting, about hockey. You know, yeah, I yeah. You know, most of the guys that are working in there yeah. and have a little chit chat. I love it. You know, I stroll. Sometimes I'll walk in there, spend an hour and a half, and I won't even purchase anything. Other wow. times I'll be in there for thirty minutes and I'll buy a lot of stuff. It's just, yeah. it's just, you know, walking in there, like seeing what's new, like seeing what's oh, available, awesome. and uh, you know, when it's so many people that have the same mindset too, right? Hmm. That's yeah. the, that's what I love about it. You go into yeah. Cabela's, there's a lot of people that have the same likes. Um, and have the same passions and that's what brings out the conversation what brings out it's true you know for it's me true. walking around in there and as you know i like to talk i've never met a microphone i didn't like so <laughs> yeah i i don't mind uh, i don't See, mind chatting people I, I i personally never get tired of your hunting stories right so yeah. other people <laughs> me it's personally true. 
I yep. love I yep. love a great hunting story. And listen, yep. at Cabela's, best banana chips in the world. In the world. <laughs> oh, yes. there's, there's, in the oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> Forget and, about it. And, and, yeah. the peak, and, and the the heated pecans. I'm like, are you guys <laughs> oh, kidding? Yeah, like, this, yeah, it's, yeah. Like, it's, like, it's like heaven going to that place. It's oh, like, they know. They, they put the scent out there for you, right? <laughs> oh, they blow it up. Every time yeah, you're walking here. around there subliminally, it's in your mind going, what is that unbelievable yeah. smell? And then they're yeah. right there in front of you when you walk out. You can't resist. You know what? They just they got it figured out. They're smart in there. <laughs> what, what, what got you into, and, you, and you're more of a bow hunter, you said. So what yeah. What got you into that? How do you get into that kind of thing? You know, hunting for me, uh, just family, tradition. You know, my grandfather, I used to spend a couple weeks with him every summer fishing. Um, used to go hunting with my dad. You know, in, Ontario? To, uh, in Ontario? In Ontario, yep. Ontario. Yeah, I grew up in Ontario. So cut my teeth on grouse and rabbits. And yeah. I was just talking to my dad the other day, and I, you know, some of my most favorite memories – as a kid growing up, you know, I'd see my dad at the door in the school and I'm like, oh, no, we probably have like a dentist appointment or something or a doctor's appointment or what's going on. And, you know, he'd knock on the glass. Yeah, I'm here to take Louie, you know, my brother Luke. And, you know, we'd go jump in the car and, you know what, we'd be like, where are we going? We'd look back in the back and we'd, you know, see the guns and we'd be like, oh, yeah, we're going. <laughs> you know, he'd come and get us early on a Friday and, Great. you know, take us hunting. And I, I mean, I remember that. That's the stuff you remember yeah, as a kid, right? I remember trying to wake him up early on a Saturday morning to take me out rabbit hunting and grouse hunting. <laughs> and, um, you know, I lived on the edge of town, guys. I lived in Port Elgin, small yeah. town in Ontario, and I lived yeah. right on the edge of town. And when I say on the edge of town, it was cornfield to the right of me and field across and, the street from me and, in bushes. and bushes and pumpkin festivals yeah you know what it was just, yeah, yeah, there, actually, yeah we had uh, yes, yeah there I, was, um, I grew up in windsor so i i knew yep. about i knew about the pumpkin festival yep. and I, I remember one year someone had like a 1700 pound giant. pumpkin giant pumpkin giant. yeah crazy yeah. yeah tamri court actually a girl that i knew growing up her dad used to grow pumpkins just down the street from us wow. and uh yeah he he, he there were, some of them were gigantic from what <laughs> yeah. I yeah, yeah. just massive but but you know what that's how i cut my teeth and i used to you know go out and tromp through the bush and go down to the pond and i just always liked the outdoors and then you know hockey kind of uh made that take a back seat you know when mm, i started playing hockey right. competitively you're traveling you're moving around you don't have a whole ton of time and, you know, I it kind of went on the back burner, but when I came out here and met my now wife, her uh, her dad was a really avid outdoorsman, Art, uh, Miles is his name, and no longer with us, you know, and he was he was uh, an amazing man, but he got that, the juices flowing again. Wow, He kind of awesome. reintroduced me to the world of hunting, and I would, kept driving by this archery store on the way out to Wobman. We go out in the warm water discharge in Wobman yep. uh, Lake, which is just west of Edmonton here. And during the season when I was playing with Edmonton, Brian Marshman, Scott Thorpe, and myself, oh, wow. we would grab the fishing rods, we'd shoot out, and we'd fish for a couple hours because there was always water running there from the, the power plant. Yeah, that's right. That's and right. Uh, you know what? It would just gave us a little bit of an outlet to go out and you know fish for a little bit for a couple hours, turn the mine off, and come back. And mm. I kept seeing this archery store, and I just drove in there one day, and Jim Johnson was the guy's name that sold me my first bow at Trophy Book Archery. <laughs> and uh, you know what? Uh, he uh, he owns his own store now in Calgary, and there's a second store here in Edmonton, awesome. Jimbo's Archery. But uh, you know what? Couldn't have, ha couldn't have had a better guy to introduce me to archery, to be honest with you. He wow. just he took his time. I was the only guy in there. He let me shoot a bunch of bows. And once I shot one and got into it, that was it. I really never looked back. I just mm. – and it, to be honest, it's like fly fishing for me too. Yeah. I love bait casting. I love spin casting. I like deep sea fishing. I love fly fishing. I yeah. think it's just incredible to be able to tie your own flies it and is. catch fish on that. I just, it's a little more intimate. You know, it's just one of yeah. those things that you're really into it. And I find archery to be the same. It's difficult. It's humbling. It'll, it'll really floor you because you're going to put the time and effort in there. And I'll tell you, <laughs> yeah. you're going to be humbled more often than not. The, the deer win 99% of yeah. the time. Right. Yeah. But, yeah. uh, you know what? I just, I like being out there. I just like being uh, one with nature, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And when you're in their world and they don't know it, there's nothing better. That's awesome. <laughs> That's really cool. <laughs> now your son is in the NHL and yeah. I mean, I think it went national news when he scored his first goal. Uh, yeah. And then I thought the great part was when you interviewed him on the ice. <laughs> yeah. Tell us, I mean, obviously that would be a dream for most no, but, Canadian you know, fathers, but yeah. what was that like for you in that moment? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know what? It was, um, it was truly special it, both yeah. occasions, you know, what his first goal for us to be there as a family and see it. I mean, you can't, the script couldn't be written any better. Mm. It really couldn't have. And it was awesome. 
this game's given me a lot. I got to tell you guys, it's been uh, remarkable to me and my family. And uh, to see him come up and score that first goal in his first game with the Bruins, I, uh, you know, ah, I, the, but yeah. the tears came out. I was just so overwhelmed awesome. because I understand um, how difficult it is to make it. I understand mm. how things have to go right. You have to make good on your opportunities. You have to be lucky. You have to put the work in to get there. That's and right. uh, not that that was, you know, that was just the start. And right. I knew that, but it was a pretty wicked start. You know, yeah. for I me, agree. it was pretty awesome. <laughs> and then to interview him, you know, that came about. And uh, <laughs> it was just, I didn't expect him to chirp me right out of the gate. You know, I kind of <laughs> yeah. said, hey, kid, what's up? You're back at him. And he's like, yeah, yeah you know what? He, he chirped me about my hair. He chirped me about yeah. my stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so I went in there trying to be the pro. And that's kind of the thing, too. You yeah. know, like I know that people watch and, I try and play the professional when I'm calling Jake no matter James what. and the yeah, Bruins. Yeah. I always try and keep yeah. it down the middle. Every once in a while, you know, I'll catch myself watching them at real close oh, yeah, range. Yeah. And that's a special thing for me, too, to be able mm. to be down there at ice level and watch my kid right up against the ice. Yeah. I mean, not too many people get no. a chance to do that. I know Dave Lowry's on the Winnipeg Jets bench this year, and he gets to see Adam all the time. Adam was remarkable to my son, Jake and Swift Current, when he was a young man. Always have time for Adam Lowry. But, you know, I, you know, to me, um, two of the things that I'll never forget in my life, two of the things that are the most special things in my life, being able to do that with my son. Wow. Yeah, so uh, if you were on a hunting trip, Louis, like a hunting trip, and you could pick four people to come with you, I don't, <laughs> living, living, or oh. li living or dead, oh. which, four, which four people would you pick to go on that hunting trip? And the, and the hunting trip would last about two to three days. So who would you be out there with? It's pretty easy. That's okay. an easy answer for me. It would be uh, my grandfather, my dad, my son. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. yeah, to have us all together um, yeah. doing something. I actually got to go hunt with Jake this year, and that's one thing, you know, I didn't, you know, he was such a busy young man growing up with his hockey, and my daughter was busy with her sports too, and I did introduce him to archery. They both can shoot a bow really well. But, you know, the hunting aspect of it is something that you have to learn at an early age, I think, to kind of really have that passion. You can pick it up later, and I'm hoping maybe one of them does. Yeah. But uh, I got to go out duck and goose hunting with uh, my son, Jake, during this whole pandemic. And at the end of it, when it opened up in the fall, um, we went uh, with a good friend of mine, Darnie Kisslinger. And, uh, you know, it was awesome. That's just a great way to cut your teeth. Yeah. And there's action. There's birds coming in, the calling, having them land in the decoys. Yeah. And our shots were awful, by the way. <laughs> uh, we were not very good, but it didn't matter. You know, we're just spending that time. Yeah. And I think that's really what it is for hunting. So when you ask me that question, I just, I got to hunt with my grandfather up at the Blair Hunt Club, which is up by Huntsville. And um, I know it. Yeah, I know it is. <laughs> it's been in my family's name yeah. for, you know, 70 years. You know, my wow. dad's been going up there yeah. now for, I'll bet she's been going up there for 50, 60 years. My grandfather, I got to hunt with him, I think, when he was 83 years old. I went wow. up there on one of the lockouts and uh -huh. hunted moose in October. And uh, to be, you know, he could have walked me in the bush at that time. You know, he was just one of those old school guys, never drove a car in his life, never had a license, walked everywhere. Never complained. Never, never complained. complained. You know, never just complained. Could, could do anything, was handy yeah. in any regard. If something needed awesome. to be fixed, he didn't hire somebody to do it. He just did it. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> You know what? Uh, that would be the that would be the ultimate uh, foursome to go hunting with, right there. I think that's awesome. Well, uh, Lee, I mean, obviously, you probably have a million stories, and anyone that's talked to you knows that if you talk to Louie, you're going to get some genuine conversation out of him because that's just who you are. And I think the people watching, and again, we've had some amazing guests on the show, um, but I think the one common denominator that we try to get is people with. With the character Char like yourself, character, character, and, and, and that's and, what that's why that's why it's been so successful. Our show <laughs> because we're not like you know what people say all the time. Like Mark, you could get this guy, you could get this guy. I'm like, yeah. Could you imagine talking to some people? <laughs> I don't I don't want to say who they are because I don't want to get in trouble on our own show. But could you like this is a 45 minute or hour long interview? Who could carry that through like that? You know what yeah. I mean? Like there, there's only certain guests what, that can do that. What was it? What is it that you know? You know, you hate to, but sometimes you get you, you. We hear about the bad apples in athletes in in professional sports, and and yeah. what was it that you decided? Hey, I'm going to take the time to talk to people. Uh, in what regard, Jesse? Sorry, well, I'm just not... in, you know, sometimes there's people that you know don't have time for the fans, don't have time to oh. sign an autograph, don't have time to to talk yeah, or you know, spend time. I just think you know, to be honest with you, I've always been grateful for the opportunity and. 
there was a time, you know, I, I got to be honest with you. There was a time that it was, it was almost embarrassing when people would ask for my autograph. You know, I, I just had that. Honestly, I just, yeah. you know, I would, they would come out and I would be like, just, just that confidence of, you know, when you're a tough guy, you're not playing much. Sometimes you're a healthy scratch. I was a healthy scratch for like 50 games one year. You, you start to lose your confidence in that mm, regard. Of course. Of but course. I, but I honestly, you know, I've always kind of felt I could always give somebody some time. I know these people are there for a reason. They're there because they're passionate fans and they want to be there and they're supporting us. I also think of the veteran players that when I first came to Edmonton, and this starts in junior, by the way, you know, playing in London, which was a terrific organization. Right, right. We did a lot of community things in London. London we were always, you know, signing autographs. They encouraged that, doing, you know, promotions out in the city. And, you know, I lived there year round. My mom and dad moved there my last year. So, it starts there where you're going to golf tournaments, you're representing the Knights, you're representing your organization. Um, and that just continued on in Edmonton. Edmonton has always been one of those places where, you know, Glenn Sather, when I came on with the Oilers, we, it was, it was, you know, they didn't ask you, this was something that you just did. You know, yeah. you went out, you know, you had hospital visits every mm-hmm. year. You went to the sick kids, you went out and did tournaments. You were asked to do um, public speaking and public appearances on behalf of the organization we did autograph sessions at West Edmonton Mall where we would yeah. practice and we would have lineups, you know, to, to, for people to come through and, and sign autographs. And I think it just instills in you early on that, you know, as I said earlier, this game's given me mm. everything. It's given me a ton. Yeah. And to give back in that regard whenever you yeah. can, I just think is it becomes natural. And, you know, my my son does the same thing. You know, my son picks that up. Boston's one of those organizations mm-hmm. when you're led by Patrice Bergeron and Zidane Chara. I mean, they lead by example in that organization. They just, that's part of it. That's who you are. You're representing that organization and you're representing that organization wherever you go and what you do. And you try and take the time to give back because those respective cities have given so much to that team. But yeah, you know, that's kind of it. And I've always been a talker. Like you say, my kids give me trouble about it because it's kind of an old <laughs> school thing, right? You know, I can yeah, I can go cool. into an environment where I don't know anybody yeah. and I'll sit and all of a sudden I'll strike up a conversation. That's a gift. That's yeah. a gift. And I'll that's be talking gift. with somebody for half an hour. My, yeah. you know, Jake will be sitting there going, are you serious? Like, do you know that guy? And I'm like, no, why? No. He goes, well, what did you talk to him about? <laughs> what no. do you mean what did I talk to him about? I just talked about him, but whatever, <laughs> right? Like, you know, but it's kind of funny, but I catch myself. My kids, the kids don't mind, uh, busting me on that from time to time that, that I, awesome. I have a, I have a knack for finding a conversation wherever I go, but yeah, you know what? I've always felt that way. And I think it's, it's a kind of something that, yeah. uh, you know, I do a lot of, a lot of golf tournaments in the summertime, mm-hmm. obviously with this pandemic, a lot of things have been yeah. shut down yeah. and we haven't been able to do that kind of stuff, but yeah, it's been kind of a, it's a circuit. It's the summer. We, we, circuit, we, have to, call it. we have to find a way to do a contest with you for a hunting trip with Louis DeBrusque. Cause I saw you do one in Jasper. And I said, I said, I said to Jesse, I go for the me and Jesse podcast. I don't care what it costs. I said, we got, we got great sponsors now. So I said, we got to figure a way to get Louis to do a, like a, like a hunting trip with, two or three guys that on our show, I can't even imagine the craziness that would go on for people that would want to go on a hunting trip with you. You know yeah. what I mean? Like as a contest, because let alone the stories, the, the camaraderie, but just to go out hunting with someone that really loves it as much as you do, but at the same time, get to hear all the great stories off the record. Off the record stories. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, you know, it's funny. It's uh fishing too. I've done yeah. a couple yeah. of words fishing yeah. or the raffle yeah. fishing trips yeah. and I'm lucky enough to be involved in it. I'm always yeah. happy to go on one of those. And again, this pandemic has kind of put a hold on a lot of things and hopefully we can get back to yeah. doing a lot of that stuff. What's it like without fans in the stadium? It sucks. It does. Yeah. It really does suck. I, I, there's no other way to say it. It's uh, it's just not the same. Um, mm. I what do the players honestly, think? Like, what do they feel the same? Yeah, they're they're starting to come out now and talk about it okay. more regularly. I think because yeah. now that you've gotten into that, not quite the midway, but you're past a third of the season, you're getting into that halfway point, yeah. and I think the realization is these games are ratcheting up, and the intensity is there, and the importance of these games is there, but the fans aren't there, and it's just it's so obvious and. You can only buckle down and focus for so much mm. before you start to look around and go, you know, it really sucks. There's not people yeah. in this building to be able to experience some of the things that have happened on the ice this year, mm. because there's been some fantastic play. There and that's been. what I will say is the players, I have to take my hat off to them to be able to buckle down and put the effort they have on the ice every night. Hats off to you. Cause that's incredible. I yeah. know that for us and you know, our, our companies have done an amazing job Rogers. And I know that, you know, we're doing games 
they try and make it as lifelike as possible. Right. They pump in the fan noise. Yeah. They try yeah. and give you that atmosphere. And we can, once we dial in and we're calling the game, we're focusing on the ice, you really do forget for a brief moment that there aren't fans in the building because you're kind of hearing the rumble in your headset that isn't really there. Oh. But oh, you can but hear to be that. honest with you, when that whistle stops and you take your headset off for intermissions, you yes. come right back to reality. Mm -hmm. It's like yeah, you being dropped onto the floor. You go, oh, yeah, there isn't anybody here. It's, it's weird. Tight, and you weird. can hear a pin drop in here. Man, oh, man. It's just really, it's really odd and – I've heard some players start to speak up about it now. Mm. I've heard some players start to pipe up about it now that it's starting to trickle into their mind. They're yeah. starting to it's starting to get really old, is the saying I'm hearing. Right. I agree with them. Yeah. I, I don't think anybody can wait that much longer. They want fans back in the building, and I truly do hope that they get to come back into the building soon. Right. I just truly hope that life goes back yes. to some semblance of normal. Sure. I mean, hockey's a microcosm of that. Right, I understand but, that. But yeah. in our world, it's a huge thing. It's yeah. massive. It's yeah. everything. It really is everything. And I'm not just saying that. What people have to understand is that these players, I know that we see the money. We see what they make, the, yeah. the glamour, the limelight. But really, it's about playing in front of a packed house. It's mm. about being in the biggest buildings in this respective sport, the fans cheering your name, the fans booing you. It doesn't matter. The noise and the atmosphere, that's what these players get pumped up for. Mm. They want to be on that stage in front of a packed house and do great things. It's just not the same when it's empty. I remember Theo Fleury actually said we had him recently, and and he said that time that you run out of the, the down the runway to the ice in the beginning yeah. of the game, first, second, third period, there's nothing like it. Yeah. It's yeah. I remember, yeah. you know, like for my first first playoff experience, especially, and it just see the, the season gets ratcheted up. And there's obviously certain matchups. This North Division this year is just <laughs> well, it's like yeah. a playoff game every night. But you know, like it just ratchets up throughout the course of the season and then in the playoffs. And I remember coming out at the old Coliseum in Edmonton mm. the first year we made the playoffs yeah. that I was an oiler. The hair on the back of my neck still mm. stands up when I think about yeah. it because it was just it yeah. it's unbelievable the feeling when you come out into that bowl and it's just you know uh, my wife and i recently in the last couple of years went to to italy to rome and we got to see the coliseum mm. the actual coliseum yeah. Yeah. and i gotta tell you when i stood in that building yeah. and when i stood in that structure um that was still remaining in the in the coliseum i i just couldn't help but the whole reason our rinks are built that way are because yeah. of that, you yeah. know, because yeah. of how that looks. And when you're like a gladiator, yeah. I can just yeah. imagine a gladiator, you know, like Spartacus, you know, yeah. in the middle of that Coliseum. Oh, yeah. But that's what it's like. It yeah. truly is. It's truly like that. When you're a player down there on the ice and you're looking up and all you see is a mass of people that are screaming and yelling and the noise, yeah. it's, Everybody in their life should have, be able to experience that. I know we Just don't one. all get to, <laughs> yeah. but everybody should yeah. because it's there's nothing like wow. it. It's incredible. Yeah. Before we let you go, a couple lightning round questions. <laughs> uh, yeah. Your most memorable fight. Oh, boy. That's a good one. You know, I uh, first one, obviously, Jim Thompson hmm. um, with the LA Kings. Like my first NHL game, I fought him. But, you know, I always kind of say I had a marathon fight with Marty McSorley, yes. a couple of them. He was yeah. always a real, like, he's a super tough guy, one of the best at his craft in the business. But Sandy McCarthy, you know, Sandy oh, McCarthy wow. was a guy that just, you know, he had my number. He oh, did. Really? He just, you know, <laughs> he was one of those guys psychologically. He just was in my kitchen, you know, making a <laughs> peanut butter sandwich right at my, and you look at me going, what are you going to do about it? And, uh, but our first fight, our first fight we had was a doozy. It was a good one. And uh, it was kind of not that much defense. It was switching hands. We both got bloodied, and we both went to the penalty box. And I remember looking over going, this guy's tough, like this guy. Because I kind of gave him as good as I had, and he came back, and we both were marked up. And that was my favorite fight because I don't know if there was even a winner in the fight. It was just two guys that didn't really know each other and just went at it. It was an exhibition game in Calgary. Oh, boy. And, wow. uh, I just remember instant respect for McCarthy after that fight because I didn't know how tough he was. I knew I'd heard a lot of talk about mm -hmm. him coming up the ranks, but when we went at it, and listen, he ran through the league for the next few yeah, years. He, did, he was, yeah. in my opinion, he was top three, four for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, best player that you played with? Oh, geez, you know. <laughs> I know. You can... Well, you know, yeah. I, play, I played with um, – you know, Jeremy Roenick in Phoenix, mm. Keith Kachuk oh, yeah. in Phoenix yeah. were, were, you know, you know, 
Keith Kachuk, a 50 goal scorer, 200 penalty minute man. So he kind of was up my alley that way, you know, just that he did a little bit of everything. Both of his boys were exactly the same way. Truculent, as Brian Burke would say, no yeah. question about Tru- that. Truculent. Um, yeah, <laughs> you know, those guys are just uh, um, remarkable players. But I'd probably say those guys, you know, I, I mean, I never got to play with Gretz. You know, obviously he came yeah. afterwards. He was my owner for a bit when I was in Phoenix. So yeah. I guess I got to skate with him. And I guess it's funny. So this is a kind of a funny story. So Wayne comes in with the buyers group. They're buying the Phoenix Coyotes. They take over the team. And he's kind of hanging around. And we're like, you know, is he going to come back and play? Because this is relatively <laughs> yeah, yeah. fairly recent after he, he retired. Yeah. Yeah. So we're like, you know what? The great one might come out of retirement just to get this franchise going. I'm thinking that'd be amazing to play with Wayne. But so he started skating and practices with us but the night before his first practice he comes in and we're I'm, I'm a healthy scratch that night against the team we were playing that night we're sitting watching the game he goes hey Louie he goes I'm coming out for practice tonight and I told Bob Francis to put me on your line okay so I uh-huh. actually I ended up skating with him the next day in practice which is but then he but then he says to me he goes yeah he goes listen if I pass you the puck it's a mistake give it back <laughs> <laughs> but you know what i knew it was from love gretz loves yeah. the tough guys and he always yeah. takes care of the yeah. tough guys he treated me like gold when he was the coach in uh, in phoenix and i was doing the radio down there so but i thought it was funny it kind of broke the ice but i did get to skate with him so it's pretty That's hard for me not to say gretz is the best player I ever played with <laughs> even though it wasn't officially in a game i yeah. did get to skate with him in practice one day and it was awesome yeah. Uh, sure. What's your What's your? I mean, it's pretty obvious, but what? Tell us your opinions of Connor McDavid. Oh, yeah. You know what? I, uh, I, I, I. It's funny because we. I honestly think we almost govern our opinions of Connor McDavid because mm. we see so many great things on such a regular basis. Yeah. But it's outstanding, guys. It really is. I, the things he's doing right now in the game are just like any other great in the game in the sense that he's revolutionizing and changing the game every single time he plays. Yeah. He is making defense and team defense change their structure in the way they attack and play against him mm-hmm. because he is that good. So when when the great players come in the game, the Bobby Orr defenseman that rushes up the ice, Wayne Gretzky behind the net, you know, it doesn't matter. The greatest players in the game, what they do is they tailor the game to their strengths. Right. Yeah. We've never seen a player this fast, this skilled, that can do things at that speed. And do things that most people can't do. Period. Yeah. Let yeah, alone Mach speed. nine. Yeah, you know, yeah, like it's like forget yeah. about it. So, I honestly scratch my head every single night when I watch this kid play. Um, he's got an engine that never quits. He's got speed to burn, and he has the hands and skill set to finish things off at that top speed that we've never seen. We have never seen it. We've seen players close, but never this no. fast. Mm. Uh, you know what? Uh, we had an argument the other day. Already 500 points and 369 games played for Connor McDavid, tied Sidney Crosby for that. But again, he's doing it in an era when it's even more difficult to put up points. So so for me, that 500 points is incredible. And he scored his last 100 in 63 games. Yeah. 63 yeah. points and picking up the pace. 100 points in 63, <laughs> 63 games, games was the yeah. last from 400 to 500 took yeah. him 63 games wow so he's getting better yeah every yeah. single year yeah. yeah um the sky's the limit for him but i put him in top five ever to play the game already and i know that's a oh, bold yeah statement. i know that's a bold statement but i'm telling you i know he's never won a stanley cup i don't care i know that you know what he hasn't had a real long playoff run yet i don't care what yeah. he's doing right now in the game in my mind puts him top five all time but louis i don't want to put you in this crap situation but does he have the same ability like a michael jordan to to to, 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 what i'm saying it's not about hockey skills we already got that clear he's great he's gonna be he is i agree with you he's doing he's got a flash to him that no not even the fedorovs the 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 pavel burries none of those guys had the flash like this kid but does can he do what what jordan did in the dressing room can he do what those guys did to elevate to elevate those guys because everybody's yeah. got the talent now to win a Stanley cup. Everybody. We, we saw that yeah. it, it's what happens in the dressing room to finally say once and for all, Hey, Connor's got to be the guy. It's not dry sidle. It's not, it's not none of these guys. It's got to be Connor. And you see him on the bench now yelling more. You see him chirping oh, yeah. guys. You, and he didn't see that before. You're seeing it now because it's great. It's great to have 500 points. It's great to have everybody, but everybody wants the rings. The rings, mm-hmm. listen, listen, my Uncle Marty, my Uncle Marty's got four of them. He's 93 years old. You could call him on the phone right now in Big Sky, Montana. My Uncle mm-hmm. Marty, I'm giving my Uncle Marty Pavlich a big plug right now. And he, he'll tell you, 
doesn't mean anything, Mark. He doesn't have, you don't got these. Yeah. It don't mean shit. And that's how he talks at 93 years old. Yeah. Well, that's how Connor McDavid talks too. I Perfect. don't know if, you know what I'm saying? You like there, if you listen to what go. he says, you know, they're, they're raffling off, you know, you've won the Art Ross a couple of times, care. you know, you're just, he doesn't care. He honestly looks and goes, yeah, they're all nice. But when he talked about Sidney Crosby, and this is the most recent where he had his 500th point, it was the same amount of games yeah. that a guy that he looked up to, let's face it, Sidney Crosby, yeah. same thing. Yeah. He did the yeah. same thing when he broke in in right. 2005. That's right. That's right. He's, we just, you know, 100 points as a rookie, you're like, wow, this kid's unbelievable, <laughs> yeah. right? So was Ovechkin that year, by the way. Both That's those right. guys just broke yeah. onto the scene and they're right. generational oh, players. <laughs> That's right. You know, um, but Connor always says he's got a – he's got a specific trophy in mind that mm. I don't have yet. And that's yeah. the only one that he really, really right. cares about. Um, I think he has the desire to be the best he can possibly be every single, every sure. night and every single year. And that's why he works so hard in his game, but everything he does, every single little thing he does is for that ultimate goal. And you know what? You, you, you hit the nail right in the head. He's changed this year. There's mm -hmm. been, yeah, there's been a progression it. with him. And yeah. I do to answer your question. Yes. I think that he, is realizing that it is going to be him. And that's why this year, yeah. with the way he's playing, yeah. no, his, uh, <laughs> the way he's playing is making it really difficult for anybody to defend him. Mm -hmm. And that's his ultimate goal. He's going to put this team on his back, and he has a pretty good running mate in Leon Dreisaitl. But, yeah, yes, sure does. I do think he has Jordan that has mentality. <laughs> the the general, generational yeah. players in the league, they find a way to win a Stanley Cup. Yeah, that's true. They always do. Yeah. They always, always do. do. Even OV, always when do. people thought it was done. They find a way to win a Stanley Cup. Well, yep. Louis, uh, like, I mean, how much more can we say about you? You're a great guy. Uh, we love hearing you on TV. Uh, everyone is appreciating you, obviously, tonight, yeah. too, from yeah. hearing what you're saying. And and uh, we just wish you the best of luck with your uh, career, wherever it takes you. Maybe there'll be one day a global league, and you'll be the head of it. But, <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> but no, I don't know about that, but... Well, thanks, they say, you know, they, say, they, say character. they say, they say people always bug us and say, hey, you know, how do you pick your guests? And we say, we do pick our guests. Our, our guests don't pick us. We pick you yeah. because <laughs> you, like you are our, you're our draft choice because people don't understand. We, we cannot do hour long interviews with people. People say all the time, Hey Mark, get this guy from the NFL. I'm like, could you imagine being with him? And I love him. I love the guy. You know, I have a lot of guys yeah. in, in the NFL that, that message me all the time. And I'm like, you imagine an hour long conversation with this hard. guy from then. Oh, it would be, <laughs> it would be to torture questions. Well, this yeah. went by pretty quick actually. So yeah, I'm correct. glad that we can fill some you, time. For you it. lived up. But, you lived uh, up. Thanks lived for having up. me guys. You lived up to the billing, Louie. You really did. Thanks you so really much did. for joining us. And we hope to chat again one day. All right. Definitely. For sure. De Take definitely. care guys. Awesome. Thanks, chat with you. Thanks Louie. That was Louie DeBrusque, everybody. Obviously great guy. Louis, great, great. Louis, Louis, hey man. <laughs> When you when you get and it's hard too because you know sometimes you worry because when you get guests you're like worried if they can say things or not and yeah. I appreciate the honesty I appreciate the openness and and to share stories and and to say how it is and as I said in the beginning of the interview I said hey man we don't he doesn't BS us when he's on the air he tells it how it is and I appreciate that that's right because I find sometimes that uh, some people put on the act and yeah. I don't get that with Louis I don't feel that no. at all with Louis I feel that there's a genuine nature that hey. I love this sport and I'm going to tell it how I see it. And, and I really appreciate it. I think there needs to be more like Tony Romo, for example, from, from CBS. Awesome. I love that guy on, on because awesome. he understands the game. He loves the game and he wants what's best for it. And so I think that's guys like Louie and, 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 and there's others too, but it, it just, there's a reason why their popularity is growing so much. Well, Louis turning into that though. Louis is going to turn into that Romo in the NFL. Yes. He, he, the knowledge of the game, the, the uh, ice level when he's on ice level and he can break down the game. Fantastic. And like I said, when he first started, everybody was kind of like, well, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't well, know. We're always like that. You know, we, we are yeah. jerks when it first comes out and we don't That's like right. change. So yeah, it's <laughs> I like, remember but that then too. And, and you know, yeah. and, and, and and I didn't tell him this, but I'm a huge Flames fan, as everyone knows. But, but, yeah. uh, <laughs> so, you know, I, you know, cause it was an Oilers broadcast I was watching. And so, of course, they're leading that way. But you get mad because, like, oh, all they care about is the Oilers. Well, yeah, obviously, that's their job. That's, but, that's their job. <laughs> but yeah. no, I really appreciate that interview, of course. What do you think about the, the comments about Connor McDavid being Jordan esque? He or is. Or Brady esque? He, 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 no, excuse me. Let's <laughs> switch that now. Yeah. He is, but. Connor is Brady-esque, but at the same time is esque. 
we 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 right. put in quote we right put in quotation there's... s you yeah. got to listen i don't care what anybody says sports people all around the world can argue this with us but on the me and jesse podcast unfortunately you are going to hear the truth a lot <laughs> and what happens is you're going to hear the truth not not uh skewed which means right. he is he is brady-esque now because he hasn't won a championship yeah that's it if he goes if he plays another 10 years for the oilers and they don't win a championship he is not brady-esque he is not jordan-esque he is he is a great hockey player but we're gonna we're gonna hey, listen you ask ov the same question right. right now we can call him up and say hey until he wins that stanley yeah. cup yeah you, you, that stamp is not there. And, and I think no, that was the thing with Ovi was that, that yeah. you know, and he knew that too. And I think Connor does as well. I don't think, oh, he knows, I mean, I think yeah. Ovi was getting maybe nervous because <laughs> it was coming yeah. on the tail end, right? Like hey, what? Yep. It, 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 it took a while for him to get there and they had some good teams too. Come Washington. on now, the o- but the Ovi celebration oh, was at, like, there was you want to talk like about it. They, they actually made it, rules. They had to make rules. Talk about changing the game. They had to make rules for people not to celebrate as much. <laughs> the best of all time. Like you, you want to talk about Brady letting tried it out. this time. Brady tried. Brady did well. Yeah. Brady did well. Had a few cocktails. Yep. He definitely did. But let, let me tell you, when, when Ov did the celebration, <laughs> I couldn't get oh, enough yeah, of it. it so I couldn't good. get enough of it. And Swimming that, in that's, fountains. Well, that gives you an example, though, telling people, hey. Yeah, I, no. I, I this was I had to let it to out. To me, because, to me, that was yeah, yeah. the 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 revelation of it. How no important question. it was to him, and, and I think right. that is the thing. I think I think McDavid can win. He's going to have to carry the team on his back. And and he you know, and again, like I said, like yeah. Michael Jordan had Scottie Pippen, Connor McDavid has Leon Dreisaitl, and if they can keep that relationship, and, and you know, maybe Jordan's Pippen's, and it wasn't great, but yeah, they came and won together. So yeah. if Col- they can Col- do Col- that. Kobe Shaq, yep. Kobe Shaq, same hey, thing. Man, you know, there, like there's there's yep. there's proof that you can do it, and yep. and and I mean, hey, Gretzky had a whole team of guys with him as well, <laughs> so you do yeah. have to have a good team as well, and I think that's something that, for example, you know, Russell Wilson, the Seahawks, he wants a better O line, like you, and I think and these guys so. have the right to ask that now. Like, they sure do. And McDavid says, hey, this year, guys, you go get me a goalie, go get us a goalie that that can shut this thing down. When we need them to, and and again, some of the backups that they have have been playing all right, but but you know, get mad at me for saying that, but it's true. They don't have that yeah. true number one. They don't have the true number one defenseman like they had with Pronger that took them down the road. Then, but he's coming though. But he's coming. He's coming. And you and you can say whatever you want. I've said it earlier on this show. It's coming. I I think it's a matter of time before they do. It's co- no no. I I agree. But what I'm saying is. Uh, nurse is on his way. No. He like yes. Disagree. Listen, look, his athleticism. He comes yeah. from a family of of. of I I, of, I get that of, part, of but I, the guy the guy uh, on years, most man. others teams. Six year, it takes six years. It takes He's six been in the years. That long hasn't he? Not six. No, I think but it's he, been six. No, it has not. But it takes usually about five to six years for a defenseman to marinate in the NHL to become high level. I'm telling yeah, you. I, Nurse, I, I nurse don't see him that, as that number one NHL guy. It's it's gonna happen in, I, in Edmonton, and, and you don't have to like it, but it's gonna happen. <laughs> I, mean, I wouldn't like yeah, it, but the, the thing is, yeah, I, I don't see it. Podcast, I don't see him yeah, being the it. guy. I don't see him being a top ten in the NHL. And oh, he will be, and yeah. that's what the the Oilers need is a top it's ten start, defenseman. It's starting to come. It's starting to come now. He's playing thirty two minutes a game. Thirty. He's always had logged minutes but, because they have yeah, to but, rely on him. Yeah, but that's a thing now. When you want to play those minutes, though, you got to start marinating. He's getting into that year now where it's like, oh, it's coming now. He's, he's starting to make smarter decisions. Not doesn't have to make things that complex. Listen, I'm not going to jump on someone's bandwagon if they don't deserve it. I'm jumping on the bandwagon because this nurse kid, he legitimately can be that. His IQ has risen. I I think the jury's out. Well, jury's the out. Jury's out still. Jury's out. <laughs> <laughs> but again, hey, a, that's, that's it part a, of hockey. It, you do. It is. You could it have is. all the skill in the world and yeah. not do it and not yeah. win, and and yeah. that is the reality of it. You, can you imagine Connor McDavid being the greatest mm. already mm. top five player ever to play the game, never winning the big trophy? It, it could happen. It, it absolutely, hundred percent could happen. It's happened to yep. it's happened to many people, and and unfortunately, that's how it it is. It is Correct. one of the toughest trophies to win in sports, and so it. You know, it is. It's going to be interesting to see. I mean, yeah. already they're doing all right. So you, you think, hey, maybe he's changed his tune. Maybe he has 
started to realize, hey, I got a lead. It's one thing because I think when you're growing up and you have, you know, when you can score 42 goals a game when you're a kid, <laughs> it doesn't matter, yeah. right? It doesn't matter. No. You just it relies on you. Now That's it relies right. on a team, and you have to be the one not only to play the best, but to That's right. be able to carry the best. And that's where I look at guys that that were able to do that throughout their career, and and you know Ovi, yeah, uh, again was yeah. able to do that. Um, all he I didn't win. Um, uh, Gretzky obviously was capable of doing that to some degree, and then yeah. the guys like Jordan and Brady obviously as well that that can put it on their back and carry her home, demanding things. And hey, if yeah. Connor McDavid has to be the the all his players call him a jerk, fine, so be it. At least you win. Yeah, like that's Jordan. All everybody like, cares I mean, about. I think the guy's going back. He's like, yeah, he was a jerk, mm. but we won six championships. So watch, watch the documentary. Watch yeah. the documentary. I, I implore everybody to watch that documentary on Netflix, the Jordan documentary, and you'll, you'll see. He, he there's oh, some really, geez. there's some really strange moments in that documentary when he's talking about winning and how he tried to will his players to, to win, and he yeah, literally break, he, he literally breaks out in tears because he was so frustrated. To tr- that's the difference between here yeah. and here. Yeah, that's and, and, it and can I'm be telling something you that that yeah that, that it, and nothing to do with on the field or on the court or on the ice. That's right. It, it's there's a big part of that mentality, and then that's why they have sports psychologists now. That's why they that's spend right. millions of a dollars w- talking yeah. about that stuff now because they know how much the brain plays into this thing. They and sure how do. Much, and and another thing too that you know. To me, where McDavid is lacking is that leadership thing where I feel that Crosby, when he came into the league at 18, already had it. He so did. Look, that he was trained to be a leader rather he than was. just the best player in the game. And and I think McDavid's learning that, and it, we'll see yeah. if he can pick it up and actually run He needs to. He has, if to. he has to. He has to. If he does, if he doesn't, it, then he'll Leon be that does. Yeah, no, he, Leon doesn't have it. He doesn't have that mentality. I think right now he's further uh, he he's further ahead than than McDavid but, but, is in but, that but, department. But don't forget, in, where, where he came from, he had no choice. He he came from Germany, right? That, that's so, a good point, though, because yeah, he, he was had the guy. to be the guy. He was the one guy yes. that came. Right? And so he was you the have one to not guy. only be yeah. the best player on the ice, you have to teach them, you have to carry that's them. Right. You have to, that's right. And so you, by osmosis, you learn yeah. that process, whereas McDavid was just always the best, and it never – Hey, the they Germ- just put him on the ice for half the time. Well, the German, the, the German team, they, when they when they were playing in the juniors, guess who they had? You know, zoom in every five minutes. Well, they had, they, well, because but Drysaddle didn't have a problem doing that because no. that that was inbred in him. Yeah. But the one that has to do it in this team has to be McDavid. If he doesn't do it, they won't win. They won't. Well, everybody, you can, as always, like, comment, and yeah. share on this. Make sure you Definitely. share it. Make sure you check Def- out Boston Pizza, Hampton Market, and Windermere. Uh, yes. Say hi to Terry for us, and uh, we'll, we, we'll be awesome one way when we're in there. We can do a show. And um, and uh, get the lasagna. And-, <laughs> uh, hey, and and check out Jesse Martineau on all social media, yes. at Jesse Martineau. It's been flashing on the screen a few times tonight. Oh, it, yeah. I, I, I highly recommend it. Thanks so much for all the comments and, and, and everything tonight, too. It's, it Thanks, just Jesse. makes everything so much uh, more interactive and that's what we love we love the interaction we do. thank you so much louis for joining us uh awesome awesome interview oh and you know who's on the show next week who do you remember no it's a surprise <laughs> it's a surprise tune in tune in it's a surprise it's a su- oh it's a surprise <laughs> It's on the screen right now. (laughs) We will see you, everybody. Thanks, Mark. Uh, This has been the Me and Jesse podcast, the most exciting 60 minutes you spent on Facebook and YouTube plus this week. Plus, (laughs) 60 plus. plus. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching the Me and Jesse podcast. Follow us at Facebook.com slash Me and Jesse. 